So our message today is called Painting the Target. It is uh, April 10th, 2011. And uh, our first part of this message is going to come from Romans. So please turn to Romans, the 8th chapter. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. In the 8th chapter of Romans, we'll pick up in the 18th verse. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subject, subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the sons of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. What an amazing scripture. In it, the earth is personified. It's given human feelings and emotions. It is groaning to see something. Groaning to give birth. I thought Brother Michael had a good word. It will be online here soon. We're working to catch up our online database. One of the things that he asked the church is what they were pregnant with. He asked us what had been conceived in us, what needed to come from our lives as fruit. Well, it is clear that even the earth is pregnant with something. The earth is supposed to shine forth with the sons of God raising the harvest. One of the things that Mike talked about that I just couldn't help but think about was gestational periods. I mentioned some things that I wanted to follow up on. An elephant's gestational period is 645 days. Can you imagine that? 21.5 months. A human being's gestational period is 266 days. That sounds a lot longer than nine months, doesn't it? Sorry, Irma. If you wanted to give birth to a baboon, though, it only takes 187 days. You want to give birth to a sheep? 148 days. You want to give birth to a wolf? 64 days. It's amazing that wolves multiply more than twice as fast as sheep, huh? It's kind of the state of creation. It's been subjected to frustration with a hope. By the way, the reason rabbits have the reputation they do is from conception to birth. It takes 33 days with a rabbit. 33 days. In our Muslim population, about 15 days. <laughs> For whatever reason, wolves multiply faster than sheep do. This is the way that it is. It is hard for the sons and daughters of God to be born. And why is it hard? Because the environment all around us is set up against it. It's groaning. It's frustrating. But our God subjected the creation to frustration with a hope. And that hope was that there would be liberation from this bondage to decay. Friends, if you've ever been weighed down with something, if something has ever pressed upon you so that you felt oppressed, you long to be free from it. When I was a kid, I went to a Lutheran school for a while. And it might surprise you to learn occasionally I did bad things. And after a fight at a confirmation service, that, mind you, was probably entirely not my fault, where we rolled out past the... We had a drape set up and we're doing puppet shows. We rolled out through the drapes onto the stage in front of everyone. I had to stand with Bibles in my hands like this. At that time, Bibles had become oppressive to me. It caused searing pain in my shoulders. And every time I dropped my arms, the coach who was in charge of administering the punishment made me do push-ups until I couldn't do any more than stand up and do that. You know how bad I longed to be liberated from that. See, all oppression is of the devil, but it can serve God's purposes in that you long to be free from what once bound you, and then when you are free from it, you know it. Friends, you know the day of weight was taken off of your shoulders. I want to tell you this because some of you are oppressed today. I want to tell you this because some have recently been set free from oppression. Some have been free, oppressed, free, oppressed, free, oppressed as many times as there are months in your lives. I understand. It's like 
the, the book of Judges being lived out. <coughs> We're subjected to frustration like the earth with a hope. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. There are 39 books in the Older Testament, 27 in the New, hundreds of chapters. We'll start in the first one and see how many we can get through. <laughs> And only two of you are listening to me this morning, or am I just not that funny? <laughs> All right. In the first chapter of Genesis, you'll be happy to know I'm only going to focus on one verse for you. I know I teach a lot out of Genesis. I can't help it. It seems like a good place to begin. So in the 18th verse of... Uh, not 18th. In the 28th verse of the first chapter, it says, God bless them and said to them... Who is them, by the way? Adam and Eve. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Zeke, are you working at King James this morning? Yeah, what's it say for that verse? Uh, replenish the earth. What an interesting word choice. You cannot replenish something that was never replenished, huh? How do you read anything? It had to be done once and then needed to be done again. Whatever was the case with the earth, and we can fight over young earth, old earth, gap theories, no gap theories, any time that you want after the service. During the service, our point is that God gave man a goal. He gave him an objective. He said, I want you to be fruitful. In the Newer Testament, he says he wants 30, 60, and 100 fold for his investment. Like a seer, a sower that went out to sow seed. Our God wants mankind to be fruitful in order to fill the earth. This means that Him acting through you, you being a representative of Him, being made in His image and in His likeness, we're supposed to go forth and spread more of Him everywhere you go. And how do you spread more of Him? By spreading more of you. See, when you are in His presence, when you are in His likeness, it's as if you were His body. It's as if you were His hands and His feet. So that our God in the Old Testament would say things like, I split the Red Sea. But in actuality, He reached down into Moses, caused Moses to stretch out Moses' arms and a staff in it and split the Red Sea. He would say, I brought you out of Egypt. But in actuality, He used a man to do it because these men were working in His service. Everywhere they went, they were spreading a little more of Him. Now He said, replenish or fill the earth and subdue it. You have to subdue something that is resisting you. You ever seen the show Cops? Mike, can you sing that theme song for us? Bad boys, bad boys. What, you go? <laughs> you do not have to just subdue something that is ready to submit. You subdue something that is resisting you. This implies a condition upon the earth where it needed to be filled with something it was devoid of. Something needed to be subdued that did not want to submit. And our God put mankind in that position and on the very day He created them, He said, I am going to use you to fill the earth. The word fill in Hebrew is male, M-A-L-E. Looks like male, but it's pronounced male. It doesn't just mean to fill. It also says to be full, to be complete, to fulfill, to finish, or to satisfy. When God wanted to finish His creation, when He wanted to complete it, when He wanted to satisfy His desires for it to be filled, He used a man to do it. Come on now. God's work has been ongoing since the moment He said, let there be light. And it has not stopped. It extends even to your life. When God's work on the earth is going to get done, He uses man to do it. Now let me ask you something. Regardless of what you believe about the state of the earth when God said this, you don't feel something that's already full normally. When I looked at the complete word study dictionary for this, it says, spatially speaking, the, this is the act of making something which was empty of a particular content 
No longer so. There was something missing in the earth. It was lacking something. It was poor. It needed help. And God said, all right, I'm going to give you the ability to multiply. I want you to go forth and give it what it's missing. The earth is missing something. It's missing the sons of God. It's in a process of frustration until the sons of God act like the sons of God and go forward and do what was needed to be done. King David knew something of this. He had insight into it in a way that he could feel but maybe probably not explain. Turn with me to Psalm 51. Tell me when you're there. Psalm 51 is a beautiful song in our hymnals. Created me a clean heart. What an ugly time this came out of. Under what circumstances is David writing about, singing about? Under what circumstances does this become beautiful poetry in our ears? After he's made a thorough mess of his life, right? Now I know all of you are sitting out there and your life is in perfectly neat order. All of you have had God speak into it. And since that moment, the moment of your salvation, all problems have ended. You've never found yourself going, how did I make such a mess of that? You've never had a conversation that you just wish would have went differently because you got it right the first time. Huh? That's not your human experience. You mean you you also sometimes don't sow the good seed that you had hoped to? You don't make decisions that are perfect every time? Friends, some decisions are small ones and some are big ones, and yet they're all just decisions. Where are you going to live? It's a big one. Who are you going to marry? Giant one. You know, you can, you can move. <laughs> but you can't change spouses. Yeah. <laughs> Some choices you don't get to make. They were made for you by God. What family you were born into? Not up to you. <laughs> but we believe that in all things, whatever it is, our God is working for the good, the benefit of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. With that in mind, David has found himself in a horrible situation. What we would often think is, if you have done something like this, God's through with you. God's done. I mean, move on. You are reaping the consequence of what you have sowed. Well, this may be true, but our God will even use the consequence of what you've sowed for your good. How many of you discipline your kids with the intention of injuring them, wounding them, <laughs> crippling them? I'm the only... No. <laughs> <laughs> You discipline a child because you want him to have consequence, but you hope that the goal of that consequence is better living, right? Amen. More fruitful living. A, 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 a well-adjusted member of society, God willing. Listen to what David said in Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew, renew, a steadfast spirit within me. What an interesting thing. He had had a steadfast spirit. What did he do with it? He lost it. He got away from it. He didn't, he didn't stay steadfast in his steadfast spirit. So he's asking God to do it again. Renew in me a steadfast spirit. I thought I had one, but it didn't work. How many of your commitments to the Lord have been like that? You were steadfast in the Lord for seven days. And at the end of the seven days, it was pretty clear that you blew it badly. Well, Lord, I, I need to be renewed now. I was new Monday, but I need to be nude again. God is a recycling God. This is not an excuse to cheat, treat His grace as something that is cheap. But if He is a God who will renew a steadfast spirit, that means He gave you the right thing the first time. You messed it up, and He's giving it to you again. Amen. But when I say David had some insight into the earth being empty, being poor, not having quite what it needed, he says, create in me a clean heart. He could say, asa, a clean heart. Asa would be the Hebrew word that means to make from something. But he doesn't say that. He says, bara in me a clean heart. Bara is the Hebrew word that means to speak into existence from absolutely nothing. Lord, down in the center of me, there ain't anything left. It's collapsed. It's broken. You put me together. You called me a man after your own heart. 
You gave me a steadfast spirit, but somewhere in this, I've managed to carve out everything that was good. When it gets quiet like that, I have to wonder whether or not there's something inside of you going, I know what that feels like. Please don't think that pastors are excluded from this. You know how many times I have crawled in my living room, out of bed while the family was sleeping, fell on my face and said, Lord, I've ruined your church. I've ruined the relationships around me. You've got to pick somebody else. This is not working. There's nothing here good for you to work with, Lord. I have found looking back upon those moments, they were the turning moments in my life. <coughs> it's such an easy concept to go, oh, well, for the Lord to fill you, you need to be empty. But practically speaking, it's not an easy thing to do. It is such an easy thing to say, oh, lean on the Lord's arm and not on your own. But really, when you need to pick something up, how long do you wait for Him to reach down and get it? Some of these things fall into neat theological boxes, don't they? We know the good that we should do, but when it comes to carrying it out, Jews call this halakha. We heard your command, Lord, how do we walk it? That's what halakha means. How do we walk in your command? It can become more difficult. In these broken places, though, when you realize, Lord, it's not just a theological statement, there's nothing good in me, I'm a, a, a depraved sinner. It is an inward feeling. I have ruined what you've given me. And I need you to just start again. These are the moments God can do something. He can actually create in you something that you will not take credit for. Oh my goodness. How many revivals have started when men of God threw the keys to their church on an altar? How many things have gotten done for God once the men of God felt unqualified to do it? <coughs> Why would your life be any different? So what do you do? You just give up and say, oh, there's nothing good, there's no... No, I don't think that's it. But I think that we can look at every opportunity that comes forward, every grievance, every trial, every problem, is God working in us for our good instead of Him beating us to injure us. What a difference that attitude makes. One guy goes and works out because he realizes it's building his body. Another simply gets sore and feels tortured. The kingdom is exactly like that. Look at the 17th verse. This really gets pretty. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. What a difficult concept. The word broken in Hebrew... It's Shabar. Shabar doesn't just mean to break, although it does. It means to rupture into many pieces. In other words, you had it all together. You were a vessel holding the Ruach of God, and somehow or another, life fractured you into pieces. And it's poured out everywhere but the right places. You're an alabaster jar. Beautiful on the outside. God put something in you that was amazing and somehow or another you broke it. That kind of life falls at the feet of Jesus, friends. That kind of life is the one that He can do something with. He's not looking for those who are well. They have no need of a great physician. Anybody here watch the show House? House is a mean, cynical old man. Uh, he, I used to watch Seinfeld and I couldn't stand George, but he's the reason that I watched Seinfeld. You know, it's like his behavior was so despicable it was intriguing. And House is much like that. You 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 tune in to see what horrible thing this man is going to do next, right? They don't give House the cases that any doctor could solve. He's a great physician. So they bring to him the cases that cannot be solved. What kind of cases do you think our Father must delight in most? The heart. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken, i.e. ruptured, shattered, and contrite heart. 
The word contrite in Hebrew is daka. D-A-K-A-H. Daka. It means collapsed. You ever <coughs> seen somebody swell with pride of achievement? Right? I mean, maybe they just made $10,000 in the stock market. Maybe they just closed on their house or maybe their son is born. Whatever it is. And they're so excited. And then you see them a few years later. And it's like all the air was let out of their sins. All of their dreams came crashing in on them. Death does this to people all of the time. You know? They've gone and bought a new house, new car, new this, new that, new this. And then the bills begin to pour in and they realize they have built a prison for themselves and they're living inside of it. And the next time you see them, all of their stuff has not made them happy. It has collapsed upon them. Our God does not despise the person who has been fractured into pieces. Our God does not despise the person who has been collapsed in his innermost being. Deflated in his innermost being. These are the places where the sacrifice of God starts. You know, as a pastor, if I've heard this once, I've heard this a thousand times. And I'm warning you now, it makes me sick. So, fair enough? Fair enough. Well, you know, pastor, I believe I'm called to business because God wants me to be wealthy. And when I am wealthy, then I will support the church well. I'll use those things that God has given me for the good of God. Really what you're telling me is that God does not honor a broken spirit and a contrite heart. What He needs is someone who is altogether self-sufficient. And with that self-sufficient, powerful person, then God can do His work. I don't believe that. He put man in a garden without a single possession and said, go fill the earth, you own everything. But we're convinced that through the gathering of materials, through the equipping of stuff, knowledge, and everything else, this is how God's work gets done. <laughs> I'm learning very much through life's experience that is not the case. I can think of a lot of better times in our church history to have moved buildings than a week before a mission trip <laughs> and where our accounts were where they were at. But this is how the miracle of God gets told, isn't it? Where would the miracle be if we had had everything we needed ahead of time? And yet we kind of did, didn't we? We just couldn't see it. How many things in our life are like that? Victory is somewhere just beyond your ability to perceive it and yet, if you pray, you kind of know it's there. You'll never know how close you get to it if you give up. A broken and contrite heart, something that is ruptured and completely deflated, he will not despise. You know, Matthew looked up for me today on the free online dictionary. Isn't that a cool thing? 20 years ago, you couldn't say that, huh? In fact, people went door to door and sold those things and you built bookcases to fill with encyclopedias. Now it's on your cell phone. Isn't that crazy? In the free online dictionary, the definition of poor was lacking a specified quality or resource. You know, we don't always do a good job of assessing that. In fact, very often, we're pretty sure we have everything that we need. That begs the question, why are you here then? If you already have everything that you need, what made you get out of bed on a Sunday and drive here? Okay, well, I guess I don't have everything I need, but what do you need? I don't know, but I know what Becky needs. I know what Natalie needs, and I know what Debbie needs. And you know what? If Tara could just... better question is, why did God bring you here? What do you need? It's a funny thing. If you illustrate for someone else their need, what do they do? They get mad at you. They get defensive. Well, I, okay. <laughs> so our God has a little method. He puts you in situations that illustrate between the two of you what you're needing. I don't want to go back to Genesis, but I'll just tell you. He created who first? A man. Then He let the man have a task. And after that task, the man realized he needed help. About four verses before that, God Himself said, Genesis 2.18, it's not good that man's alone. 
God knew it, but didn't tell Adam. He let Adam come to that conclusion, so Adam would want the help God was giving. Wow. Matthew and I eat at a place every once in a while where they have good tacos. And there's a sign on the wall that says, God created man and then had a better idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't like that much. <laughs> Friends, a man's not independent of a woman any more than a woman's independent of a man. Our king's got a divine order that he flows through, that he works through. He started with one first, then moved to the other one, because this is the order that he flows through. But the point is, we all need to know that we need certain things. The Laodicean church didn't always know this. Turn with me to Revelation 2. It's a funny thing, growing up in the Baptist church as a kid, we would hear a speaker on eschatology every now and then. And they would say things like, oh, the church can be divided into seven ages. And each one of these churches in the book of Revelation represents one of the ages that the church will go through. Then for no matter how many ever years that message had been taught, somewhere in the early 1800s till now, everybody agrees we're in the same age, but does nothing about it. I want to tell you, I don't believe that these are seven ages of the church. Would it be too much to stretch in your mind to think that if a letter was addressed to a church that existed in the present day, that Jesus wrote the letter to that church in that day? Well, this is kind of where I stand with that. <laughs> Having said that, anytime you visit a church, anytime, let's just say we visited seven in seven days, wouldn't you see in each church that there were certain things that they were doing well and certain things that they might need some help in? Right? I would hope you would see that. Now, I come from a school of thought that says, no, if it's any church other than your own, they're all bad. <laughs> The whole world should fit in this one little building. Because you exist to support me. I want to tell you, that's backwards. Ministry exists to serve the people. So anywhere you go, you should see some things that are good. You should see some things where they are poor or they lack. But do people walk up to you and say, hey, this is what I like in? When they do, we run the other way, don't we? Doesn't somebody approach your car in a certain way every now and then? And what are you doing? You're hitting your door locks. You're adjusting the radio. You're looking the other way. You're like, don't make eye contact. Kids, don't look. Don't look. Hope the light changes. It was a shock for me to come to Houston. I had lived in places where there weren't 20 or 30 people under one overpass. I mean, I'd never seen that before. I'm like, good Lord, there's a black party. No, it's not a block party. They all want something. And they all seem to want to clean my windshield to get it. You know? They don't know that I got a little button right there to clean that windshield. We are trained to ignore the needs of others, and we are trained to hide our own needs. God didn't intend for it to be this way. Pick up with me in Revelation 2, starting in uh, verse 14. 3.14. Thank you. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. What an interesting thing. Who did God put here as a ruler first? Adam. Then He gave him a help for Eve. What was their task? Fill, subdue, replenish the earth. Take that which was empty, formerly empty, and make it not so. Adam didn't do so good in that task. So God sent His Son to take over where Adam had failed. And in Revelation, He is called something. He is called the ruler of God's creation. He's the second person to get that title. The second Adam, Paul calls him in Corinthians. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. 
make it. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. What a strange thing to say. <laughs> to tell the church that they were lukewarm. To tell the church that they didn't properly assess their situation and then say, by the way, I'm standing outside and uh, if you want to eat dinner, we can do that together. But he was speaking to a specific people group. A people group in the ancient world that meals were a sign of reconciliation. If you had a problem, if Jacob and I had a problem with each other, I might host a dinner at my house and invite him and Raquel over. When I did that, because this would take all day and involve killing of something that I might think a little bit of it, like a pet, my favorite goat, my fattest calf. He would bring something with him. He would usually bring dishes as a gift. Those dishes would stay with me and the meal that he eats would stay with him. The meal was a four hour celebration. You ate on your left elbow <coughs> and with your right hand reclined at the table. When you were done eating, you pushed back from the table a little bit. And you might sleep till the next morning because it went late into the evening. You don't do this with people that you don't like. You do this with people that you hope to improve your relationship with them. So in essence, what we have is we have the ruler of the creation saying, you have needs that you don't seem to recognize. Because I love you, I've rebuked you. I've told you what those needs are. At least how to fix them. Now the question is, will you let me come and reconcile with you or will you leave me outside of your dwelling? Well, this is a good question for the church. Have you properly assessed where you're poor? Or do you think of yourself as having everything that you need? And if you do, why? Is it because of the labels on your clothes? The emblem on your car? The figures that your salary totals to? What makes a full and abundant life? Because Adam didn't have any of those things. And God expected him to change the entire world. What makes a full and abundant life? I want to tell you there are some things that, like MasterCard said, are truly priceless. The respect of your children. Can we get a parent out there that says amen? amen. amen. That's priceless. Yes. The love of a spouse for an entire lifetime. Amen. Priceless. Being able to lay down at night knowing that you are in God's will. Priceless. These are things that cannot be purchased. How about the feeling that comes from having done something that was hard, sacrificial, maybe everybody else passed it by, but you recognized its importance. You stretched out, and in a way that hurt you, you helped someone else. How do you feel when that day's done? The pharmaceutical companies cannot make a drug that will cause you to feel that good. Right? Yeah. Yeah. These things are priceless. They are a full, abundant life to know God's will for your life. That's right. To do that work, to complete the task one at a time. This is what it means to be rich, what it means to be wealthy. By that standard, it doesn't matter whether you're running for president or not, whether you're what people call the billionaire or not. How many are poor? How many lack a specific resource, a specific quality, and they don't know it? Turn with me to Luke 4. There. It's an interesting thing. Luke is recording the words of Jesus' sermon. He's recording them years after the fact. <coughs> All of the synoptic gospels record these words. 
He could have Jesus when He walks into this synagogue and a scroll is handed to Him. He could have read from 66 other chapters in Isaiah. Or 65 other chapters in Isaiah. 66 total. But He didn't. The one place that He stops at, that He reads from one thing that He wants to announce, to avoid barren, ruptured, broken, deflated world was the good news that the Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Those of you that have studied this subject before know that the anointing is God's specific divine enablement for a task. Bezalel and Oliab were anointed to be furniture makers. Other people have been anointed to make anointing oil, anointed for music, anointed with leadership skills, anointed with a prophetic spirit. Anointed means God's divine enablement as if He was reaching down in you as a puppet, helping you to do this with His own hand. And what did God anoint His Son to do? To proclaim good news to those who lacked a specific quality or were insufficient in a specific resource. What an amazing thing. You can look at a man who feels like he has his whole life together and confidently say, the gospel is God for you. But for those who are broken by life's experience, those who have experienced a deflating of their own will, a rupturing, of their dreams and visions. The Gospel is for that person. Who is rich and who is poor? <clears throat> Michael came back from India talking about the power and poverty that breaks principalities. He's quoting Jason Upton, but he's also quoting our experience. We saw men that because they had nothing, possessed everything. They were naked by this world standard. Some of them literally little old woman that we showed you a few weeks ago, 98 years old, had little better than a shawl to cover her entire body. But she was clothed with Christ. And I'm telling you, there was not a person on the trip that would not have switched places with her. Not one. You go expecting to help them, and you realize quickly that you are envious of them. See, when something is empty, our God desires to fill it. And he does it well. But when you don't know that you need help, when you're not deflated, you're inflated. When you're not broken, you're put together. What's He going to do with you? He's just going to stand by and watch your fields get lit on fire. He's going to wait for life. The fr frustration in the creation break you so that you can begin to hope for something. This is not because he's cruel. It's not because he's sadistic. It's because he knows what your need is before you do and he's waiting for you to realize what your needs are. Let me just ask you. How many of you have entered into a relationship? Sure, that relationship will fix your problem. So the one you're in now, is it the second, third, fourth, fifth, seventh? Did the other ones fix your problems? The best advice we can give people before they get married is find out who you are in Christ, who you are in Christ before you ever enter into a covenant with someone else. When the person can stand there and say, no, I feel full and complete in the Lord. My life is awesome and this would be a blessing added to it rather than I can't live without it. That is such a lie. That is such a lie and it doesn't work. You know, in a land of arranged marriages, you find out something. God will work through any circumstance. But maybe the hardest one is the ridiculous emotional sewer that dictates our relationships. But are you saying love's not a good thing? I think love's an action that can be learned. But this mix of lust and infatuation that we're calling up 
a divine appointment. And we know that this is God. We're in sin now, but we know that we're hearing from God. He's alive. And I've watched it ruin life after life after life. Inside the church and outside it. Well, the divorce rate is the same in the church. The sin rate is the same everywhere. The sin rate is the same everywhere. But if you want to live, His Word is laid out before us. Those who adhere to the Word 100% of the time get what the Word says. Those who do not adhere to the Word 100% of the time get what the Word says they will get for that. Life or death? How much death do we have to be subject to before we will in hope cry out in our poverty for help? I saw a dog attack a weed eater one time. <laughs> what a strange thing. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, somebody needs to turn off the weed eater. They did. The dog stopped. I started to weed eat again. He attacked the weed eater again. What a stupid thing to see, huh? He's obviously not hurting the weed eater, but the weed eater is hurting him. So many times we are just like that. We're doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. Friends, we need to realize where our poverty is. This is where God can fill us. Jesus is anointed for it. Look what else. He's anointed to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners. One thing about preaching in prisons, you find out quickly. They know that they're not saints. That's why they're there. And you feel a power associated with their contrite, broken state that you don't feel outside of prison. In fact, Christians in prison, men who were radically born again there, are often horrified at the day they have to leave. And the reason that they are is all of the structure of their life is robbed away. I mean, it's, it's removed from them. They now have all the freedom to do anything that they want without the support of everything that they've learned to lean on. They so often backslide. Then people say things like, oh, it's jailhouse religion. No, friends, it was as pure as could possibly be. But we don't accept structure unless it's forced upon us most of the time. God has put you in a local church. You know why local? Why not a telecast? So that you can get to know the people and they can get to know you. He's put you under the care of pastors, apostles, prophets, teachers, elders, so that there can be some sort of interaction that points out loves, rebukes, disciplines. But we are such stubborn, independent Americans that we don't realize where we're poor. So when we have decisions that we know will not be met with favor, we hide from those that we should be meeting with, just like Adam and Eve hid from God under the garden. We cover it with fine-sounding speech with unparalleled reason and logic. You know, on a license plate, I saw a 7. And then, I looked over at the clock, and it was 7 p.m. And so I knew it was God! <laughs> oh, you laugh. I've watched marriage decisions made exactly that way. Friends, we don't know where we're poor. But your friends around you can see things that you don't see. The gospel requires us to humble ourselves. It requires us to be willing to listen to a physician. Have you ever been in a situation that you're sitting in front of a doctor and he's telling you something? You're going, there is no way. Last year I had to go to a physician and they prescribed for me a, a, a test. And while I'm sitting there nodding my head, sure, yeah, write it down. I'm thinking, the millennium will go by before I will submit to that test. <laughs> Not going to happen. So many times church is the same. We go each week to hear a prescription over and over and over and over. We know that we're not going to do a thing differently about our life. And meanwhile, you're barely <coughs> going to the fire. Y'all hearing me? Did you listen last week? Yes. And then you'll show back up in that church a year after you left it. Say, oh, I don't know. God changed his mind. You don't... The best Christians are those who lost their steadfast spirit, realized how much worth was in it. 
and begged God for another opportunity. And now they don't want to soil their garments. Those are the best Christians. You show me the new Christian that is excited about the Lord, maybe several years in, has never experienced failure, and I'm still scared of him. Because he doesn't know where he's poor again. I'd rather see somebody who is a little bit broken by life's experiences, but also familiar with God's power. How about this one? He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To release the oppressed. Is there anybody in that scenario, whether prisoner or oppressed or poor, that is not lacking something of worth? Our God has been sent with a divine enablement to help people when they realize their need and ask Him for it. And it doesn't matter whether you are oppressed and need help. It doesn't matter whether you lack some other specific resource and need help. Whether your freedom has been stolen from you and you need help. God's divine enablement is upon Yeshua to bring you out of that situation. But the one way that it will not work is when you say, no, I'm pretty good like I am. If God wants me to have those things, He'll give them to me. If you don't know your need and ask for Him, if He is not Lord and you the recipient, it will never work. Turn with me to Ephesians 1. Are y'all still interested or are you done? Yeah. 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 You know 11 times in the Gospel of Luke alone? There are 11 separate teachings on the four. Isn't that interesting? When you begin to line up the poor Scriptures, you begin to come to one conclusion that is unavoidable. God has a preferential option for the poor. Our God is most interested in those who know that they have need. So ask me again, Eric, why are all of the miracles on the mission field, why do we not see any? And I'll tell you, God has a preferential option for the poor. He's not interested in those that think they don't need Him. If He heals you, you'll tell everybody that the new drug your doctor gave you probably did it. The new vitamin you're taking probably did it. If He gives you a blessing in your business, you'll say, oh, well, the new marketing scheme, it did it. We steal His glory all of the time because we never knew where our needs were and His blessings for us actually become a snare. We're like Israel, given the promised land. Enemies being defeated all around us and then we look at ourselves and say, look what I have done. But the poor are rich in faith because they don't have anything except <coughs> the Lord gives them. In Ephesians 1, starting in the 22nd verse. And God placed all things under His feet. And at the appointed, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. What was man's original mission? To fill, to take that which was empty and meet its need, to complete it. The actual word melee, it, it means to fulfill a vow as well, to finish it, to complete it. God gave a mission to man that when man couldn't do it, He became a man and did for him. Our God has a preferential option for those who have an illustrated need. Not those who have a hidden, unspoken, undeclared need. Come on, are you hearing me? Amen. Oh, so with every eye bowed, raise a pinky. With every head bowed and every Christian ashamed. If you want to be saved, blink an eyelash. Our God is not interested in the undeclared, unrecognized need. He's interested in the life that says, I am empty without you. Amen. I need you to put life in me. Amen. I am broken and deflated and I need your help. This is who the gospel is for. I built the prison of sin for myself. And if you don't help me, I have no hope. Amen. It's like my eyes don't work, Lord. Every man that tells me he loves me, I believe him. It's like my ears 
don't work, Lord. Every time You warn me not to do thus and so, I'm deceived. I need You. These are the areas that He will rush in to meet. But He needs it to be declared. He needs to know that you know you need it. This is a requirement. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We've made that a bumper sticker type verse. Listen, you don't call out to be saved unless you know you're drowning. But our salvation experiences are, I've always been a pretty good old boy, and I love my kids, and I hunted, and I voted, and I paid my taxes, and now I want to go to heaven. So I believed on Jesus. What a lie! What a lie! You were a damn sinner the day before, and you're a damn sinner now! Except you've learned to mask your need. Because when people ask, you say, Oh, I'm I got that kind of seat. You talk to me about baptism, I'll tell you about the countries where you're arrested for it. That's where baptism means something. <laughs> Come on, church. We've been all of our lives trying to show everybody we're okay. We put so much makeup on our faces that there are no imperfections to be seen. We wear our clothes just right in colors that are slimming. <laughs> we do whatever we can to say, I'm okay, leave me alone. And the gospel is contingent upon you saying, I am not okay. Let me ask you something. We're all having coffee after this service, or maybe we're eating at Bex. That's a good idea. Hang on to that one. And while we're sitting there eating at Bex, say, hey man, how are you? What is the response? Come on, Steve. Hey man, how are you? What's the knee jerk response? Great. Great! Great life is wonderful. People are terrific. Business is great. <laughs> And it can't get great. Because if it did, there would be no acknowledgement of a great salvation. So frustration has been put all around us in the hope that we cry out for liberation. That's the hope. Our God is there to meet those who will call on Him. I am so tired of hearing repentance that is not repentant. I'm so tired of seeing salvation celebrated that was not saved from anything. Used to be that when a man got born again or a woman got born again, they said, I was a wretched sinner. I probably wronged everybody in the room. And God's grace showed up. Now, we just say, you know, I, I want to go to heaven and Jesus is just all right with me. He's the head of everything. He's filling everything in every way. If He's the head of the body, if He is the head of the body and He is on a mission to fill that which is void, if that is His mission, what is your mission? To fill that which is void. This means that we help meet people's needs. And it works best when they know they have them. I have stopped helping as a pastor people who say that there's not a problem. You know, sometimes I'm standing in this church and I have a word of knowledge about your life. Sometimes I know what it is that you will not admit publicly. But there's almost no point in telling you. Because if you're not ready to admit it publicly, He will not heal it. Can you relate to that? Do you understand what I'm saying? How many times do you help a man secretly that's problem is a public one? You know that the Proverbs say if you rescue a hot-tempered man, you'll have to do it again? Did you know that? But we want God to be the fool. Either He's our Lord or He's not. If His body is attached to His head, and He's interested in filling everything, our business needs to be in meeting needs. You don't have to tell a prisoner they're a prisoner. They already know it. You don't have to tell a blind person they're blind. They already no, if you don't have to tell an oppressed person most of the time that they're oppressed, all of them are asking for help. And in that situation, God comes through 100% of the time. Do you ever have to beg somebody to come forward for healing? Oh, come on, brother, you know that word was for you. Please, please. He prophesied he was a guy with a beard, a guy with blue eyes, a guy with a broken foot. You got a broken foot? Why don't you come forward? <laughs> if he wanted to be healed, what would he have done? When all those things were prophesied, he'd have run forward. We say, oh, well, the gospel works in the third world. But here, here it's just powerless. No, the people are 
powerless. The gospel's doing just fine. Poor is lacking a specified resource or quality. The earth was empty and poor. The earth was full of need. David's heart was empty and poor, ruptured and collapsed. Laodicea didn't understand their need. But the ruler of the creation did, so he corrected, rebuked, he wrote, he tried. He is anointed for the empty, the ruptured, the collapsed, and the poor. Our God is anointed for the empty, for the ruptured, for the collapsed, for the poor. These are who He is sent to save. Not once, but every day of their lives. These are the ones that He meets their needs. So why do we fight so hard to not be in those groups? Friends, you've really been good and whipped by sin. You want out? You show up at somebody's house and say, it's like I have something choking me and I have to get free now. Yes. The person who said that to me got free. Never returned to it. I don't have any question about God's ability to meet the need. I have every question about whether or not you know what your need is. There is no capacity in a human being like the capacity for self-deception. This is why there is a power in poverty. It strips away all of the window dressing. And it leaves just a person there with their need and their God. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is. Oh, who does it belong to, friends? Who does the kingdom of God belong to? Turn with me to Luke 6. Looking at His disciples, Luke 6.20. He said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who are poor. Is there anybody who in any other circumstances, I mean, if you had never read this, if you didn't have a Bible, you can still be born again if you want. You can make your life all the same. You just have to take a black highlighter to this verse. Never heard it before. Is there anybody that goes, yeah. Whoa, I'm poor. <laughs> no, we spend our life hating that very concept. We're in the land of achievement where the American dream is to be anything but poor. Who does the kingdom belong to? So why does God move in India? Why will we see more miracles in Mexico? Why? Because theirs is the kingdom. I know, you're waiting for the relief, like the, but you don't have to sell everything. Or you can go buy all kind of commentaries that will say that for you. But it's okay that you're very wealthy. What did Jesus say about the wealthy? Hard to enter the kingdom. Hard. So what is the answer then? Well, you can be poor in lots of ways. You need to realize where you need His help. You can say that everything you have is the Lord's and your wealth is the Lord's. But when He asks you to part with it, whose does it become? <laughs> These days, the message is God wants you rich. I'm telling you, God wants you poor. Because that's how He can meet you. You let a mother look you in the eye whose last three babies died at birth. You will find somebody who prays with love. You'll find a God willing to meet that need. That somebody, 13 year old kid named Jonathan, who is the sole provider for his household, have such a high fever that you're worried he should be in an intensive care unit. Step forward in a prayer line, not so he can feel better, but so he can go to work. And you see God healing. See, a little old woman that cannot push herself in a wheelchair around her kitchen because the dirt floor she lives on is so uneven she's not strong enough to do it. But she wants to fellowship with her neighbors and talk about Jesus. I watched her get out of a wheelchair for the first time in over a year. All of those people were poor. Matthew adds the word poor in spirit. 
it's usually that's the only place that that verse is read from. I think it's Matthew 5, 3. And that's because we don't like the idea of being poor anywhere else in spirit, something that's hard to see. Friends, sometimes the only way to be poor in spirit is to have a lack in some other areas. Oh, that car's the Lord's car, but don't you dare ask to drive it. <laughs> Come on now. Either he's our Lord or he's not. Where do you have some means? You don't know. You can't be healed. You can't get right. Blessed are you who are poor. This word is harder to say. It's potes. That sounds Spanish, doesn't it? I don't have a Greek accent. I'm sorry. It's P-T-O-C-H-O-S. I could not believe this. It means, this is a Greek word, it means to crouch, to be bent over, to cringe, like someone begging on the street. It does not mean poor in that you're working hard and you just don't have very much. It means to be completely, utterly helpless and destitute. Isn't that crazy? There's a Hebrew word that's a cognate to it, and it's A-N-I-Y. Uh, all me, and uh, it denotes the same thing, but oppression. In other words, something has pushed you into a cringing, helpless position. That's how you can define poor. Our king is anointed to take people in that position and make them the princes of the universe. To put everything that is God's at their disposal to be used only at His request. That's what He's anointed for. He is looking for those that have been beat down into a corner and don't think they have anything and He will take them and make them the rulers of the universe. Amen. Amen. This is the meaning of many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. Read the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Tell me. Tell me. Friends, we've heard all kind of corny messages on where your treasure is. Let's just be honest. <coughs> what do you want? <coughs> I can tell you, not just the American church, but our church lacks fervor and prayer. It's not there. You guys me, we don't begin to compare with the church around the world. You know how I know that? We seriously cannot pray for one hour before our services. We, we cannot do it. Uh, we can talk about football for an entire hour. But we cannot pray for one hour in public. What does that tell you about your prayer life in private? When we talk about the Word, even though we have Bibles everywhere, and we hear teaching all of the time, we're nervous to quote a handful of verses. When we stand up to teach, we're filled with inferiority feelings. Oh, y'all probably already know all this. I can assure you as one who stands here and preaches, they don't. Don't worry about it. But you can't have a birthday party in India where the kid does not quote several songs. The kid. Michael pointed out it won't start before the oldest lady in the group prophesies for 20 minutes. We're so poor, friends. And we don't know it. We call ourselves wealthy. We say we have no needs. If we just knew where they were, we could be eaten. Painting the target. It's an interesting topic, isn't it? Those of you who are in the military or like military topics. Special ops go into a place like Libya. And with a laser, they point to a target. And then out of the heavens falls a bomb guided to where that laser dot is. It's called painting a target. You want to see where God is going to drop this next Holy Ghost bomb? He's painted it with poverty. Anywhere that there's the frustration of poverty, the crying out of the helpless oppressed, He has heard their groanings. He's painted like a laser. And it is coming from the heavens. And if you want to be included in that, you better figure out where you're pulled. 
the requirement to go out on missions in the Newer Testament was to take nothing with you. Why? So you could be clothed in power on your own resources. Come on, Sam. He's painted the target for us. Look around the world. Where is the gospel thriving? Among the poor. Where is it dead? Where God's power once reigned, brought affluence, and has now moved on. You now, Europe is irrelevant these days. On a global scale, it's been irrelevant for 50 years. It was the seat of Christianity, and it brought light to the world. And then it faded as Christianity faded, and they have no need. America is following the exact same progression of events. What will your life look like? Turn with me to Luke 7. This will be our final scripture today. <coughs> Verse 20. When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? In other words, this is like asking for his birth certificate. <laughs> this is the chance to find out, are you the real deal? Or is this a fraud? I want you to hear what Jesus offered as his proof. This is what Jesus offers as proof of his Messiahship. Verse 21. At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is preached to the poor. poor. Everybody that had an ailment that they knew that they had, was getting healed. When I got back from India, God turned me to Ezekiel 34.4. I put it on a board that's in my office. I read it every day. Matthew and I discussed it at length yesterday. When we search for strays, bring back the lost, bind up the injured and heal the sick, when we look for those that God's eyes are on, are we not looking for those who are poor? They may not lack money, but they lack so many other things that are so important. I don't think that we ought to preach it today. But I want to tell you, there's one, two, three, four, five, six more stories that have not been touched on in the Gospel of Luke alone that illustrate one purpose. God's eyes are on the poor. So what are you? It's an important question that you answer. I'm going to ask you to do something that is not as cheesy as raising a pinky. I'm going to ask you to take tomorrow morning, not Tuesday morning, not today after the service, because you're going to leave and go eat and go forget about what you heard. Tomorrow morning. And think about the question, if I could add anything to my life from the Lord, what would it need to be? Then contemplate on it. See if it agrees with the Word. If it does, ask the Lord to give it to you. And I want to tell you up front, if the answer is a bass boat, you're as stupid as that sounds. <laughs> you need to get before your Maker and say, Lord, I know that I'm poor in ways that I don't realize because I don't see your kingdom in every area of my life kingdom belongs to the poor. Show me where my poverty is so that I can grow. That would be so much more productive than coming and hearing another sermon about something you already know in a new and exciting way. <coughs> and before long, all God's people will be prophets. Before long, the body of Christ will look like the body of Christ. We'll be able to hang wheelchairs on these walls when you realize where you're poor so that God can meet your needs.
or else. He's not the God of all mankind. He's only the God in India. He's only the God in Mexico, the God in China. I don't think that's true. I think he's the God of the poor. Y'all stand to your feet and we'll pray. The target is painted. We're a go. Kelsey and Mandy got to Fort Smith. They told me that there was a spiritual poverty upon the place. Things were dead everywhere. So they began to pray that God would meet that need. And last Sunday night, they had an outbreak of the Holy Spirit in the church. People prophesied, got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Kelsey prophesied in tongues for the first time in the church's history from the stage. All the leadership was scared to death until it happened to them. <laughs> if we could just realize our need, friends, God will be. Holy God, we thank You. We thank You, Lord God, for Your precious Word. We cherish it. Lord, we ask that we not be guilty of hearing it and not doing it. Show us how to put it into practice. Our heart's desire is for You, Lord. We know that You will meet every need. We ask that You show us what they are. Lord, show us what it means to walk in Your freedom. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.